Well, we're going to transition now. That closes out our research presentations for today. So we're going to transition now to the keynote talk. And normally this would be a banquet, but unfortunately we can't do that. So um, instead we are going to just have a keynote lecture. Now the uh, HAMSI workshop uh, is run. We actually have a group of people, a committee, a science and program committee that helps to decide uh, the placement of the different talks and how we organize the meeting. And so when we were trying to figure out who would be a good keynote speaker this year, uh, Mr. Bill Lyles, NQ6 said, he said, I know just the person. And so I'm going to have Bill introduce our distinguished keynote speaker for this evening. So greetings. It's with great pleasure that I will now introduce the keynote speaker. Dr. Elizabeth Bruton is Curator of Technology and Engineering at the Science Museum, London, specializing in the history of communications and her pronouns are she, her. Prominent aspects of this role include Curator of Top Secret from Cyphers to Cybersecurity Exhibition, which explored over a century's worth of communication intelligence through handwritten documents, declassified files, and previously unforeseen, unseen artifacts from the Science Museum groups and GCHQ, that's the Government Communications Headquarters of uh, England, of the UK, historical collections, and serving as co-investigation on the Electrifying Woman, understanding the long history of women in engineering, a nine months arts and humanities research council project with Professor Graham Goody at the University of Leeds. The top secret exhibition will be opening at the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester in May. And I highly recommend people to go visit if they can. When my um, spouse and I saw the one in London, we spent a whole day there. It was, it's, it's a fantastic exhibit. Dr. Bruton holds three degrees, a bachelor's in engineering and computer engineering from Trinity College, Dublin, 2004, master's of science in the history of science from the University of Oxford, 2005, with a dissertation on Marconi wireless te telegraphy in the British Army during World War I and an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded collaborative doctorate award PhD with British Telecom Archives and the Institute of Engineering Technology Archives at the University of Leeds on Beyond Marconi, the roles of the Admiralty, the Post Office and the Institution of Electrical Engineers in the invention of and development of wireless communications up to 1908, that was in 2013. So please welcome Elizabeth Bruton. Great to see her. Thanks, Bill, and thanks for a really great introduction um, and for getting through probably what is the longest PhD, unnecessarily longest PhD um, title um, in the history of PhD. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and, and honoured to be here this evening. And it was great to hear um, some of the talks earlier today. Um, I would just like to clarify that uh, I'm a historian and a museum curator. Um, I do have a background in engineering. Um, but this is going to be more about the social history of technology um, rather than a sort of a highly technical talk on the history of amateur radio and citizen science. But nonetheless, I hope um, you guys will enjoy it and I look forward to your uh, questions afterwards. So the talk is going to explore developments in the history, science, technology and licensing of the radio amateur communities in the UK and to a tiny amount of the US um, from the origins of wireless and radio in the late 1800s um, through to works on the Oscar satellite program um, in the 1970s. And while I realize all of this predates what we now call citizen science, which was popularized as a term in the US and the UK in the 1990s, I think it is a useful term um, to think about the many complex histories of amateur radio communities and the complex origins and early history of um, radio and wireless communications and related practice as it connects with amateur radio. So, um, yeah, and I think not only that, but I think these episodes in history can be useful to think about um, how we can inspire the next generation of people in amateur radio, in citizen science, and indeed in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics more generally. 
Um, so just in case you guys haven't had a chance to see it, um, that is our rather wonderful Information Age Gallery um, in the Science Museum. I know Bill and, and his wife Janet have been there and also came to see the Top Secret exhibition as well. Um, at the centre is the Rugby Tuning Coil, um, which was used to send uh, long distance radio messages throughout most of the 20th century. Um, we were very fortunate to get it into the gallery. Um, you probably can't quite see it at the top of your screen. The height difference between the top of the tuning coil and the ceiling is about six inches. Um, so it's a really fascinating artifact in the early history of radio communications in the UK and indeed more broadly. And this is a particularly interesting artifact because it was uh, operated by the General Post Office, who had a strong informative role in the early history of radio and wireless. Um, I realise those terms mean different things, um, but for the sake of this talk and for clarity, I will use radio over wireless um, just because we are talking about mostly radio communications um, throughout this talk. And it embodies a lot of the complex interests um, in the origin of radio and indeed um, that continues through to the, the present day, uh, competing interests nationally and internationally um, in terms of the military, radio amateur, professional, commercial interests, um, and state bodies that were allocated to license first commercial organizations and very soon after um, the amateur radio community. Um, so the origins of radio lie with the work of a lot of uh, people collectively and individually. Credit is often given, uh, I would argue, somewhat problematically to these sort of uh, so-called geniuses, usually along nationalistic lines. So this is um, first people like Marconi in Italy and Britain, um, then Oliver Lodge um, also in the UK, Popov in Russia, Tesla in Croatia um, and the US, um, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a particularly interesting artifact we have um, which can explain a little bit about the origins of radio um, just before, uh, well, a few years uh, before we start to see things like licensing. So this is Marconi's cohort, Cohero Receiver um, on display if the museum was open at the History of Science Museum um, here in Oxford, which is also where I reside. Um, and the interesting thing about this artifact is um, it is the artifact connected with what, what is considered the first um, wireless patent in the world granted to Marconi in July 1897. And this is the claim when people are claiming he was the inventor of radio, that's usually where that claim come from, comes from. Um, interestingly enough, um, he applied for the patent in June 1896, but in fact had worked um, on an earlier patent um, in March 1896. Now, if we return to that artifact, um, quite a lot of the art, uh, components will be familiar to people who know a little bit about the history of either radio or telegraphy. Um, the small glass object that you can see at the front of the artifact, um, this one right here, is a coherer uh, based on the work of Oliver Lodge and Edward Brandley. Um, a lot of it was related to electrical telegraphy. The spark gap transmitter he used was a Rigi oscillator developed by Augusta Rigley, who was one of his early mentors. So the interesting thing is about this is nothing about this is especially original, um, but rather he was quite keen to use the work of others. Um, and in 1901, when he sent his um, well-remembered and well-documented transatlantic wireless transmission across the Atlantic in December 1901, um, he relied largely on an Italian Navy coherer, so-called, because it was on the base, he claimed at least it was based on his, the work of his childhood friend and now Italian Navy officer, uh, Soleri, um, but actually it uh, owed a lot more uh, to the chap on the right-hand side there, um, that's Bose, the Indian physicist um, and inventor. Um, and I suppose this tells you a little bit more about the sort of complex origins of wireless and radio in the period when it was sort of settling down and before it started to be licensed. Um, sorry, I didn't realize it was gonna sort of show up the text. So in 1905, uh, it was actually sort of, it started in 1904, 1905, the Wireless Telegraphy Act passed in the UK. Uh, licenses started to be granted in 1905. And this is essentially the birth of amateur radio. Um, now, obviously, 
prior to this, there were people, there were scientists, amateurs, professionals, those with commercial interest operating the sphere, but that was incredibly hard to document because essentially licenses were granted on an ad hoc basis, at least in the UK, um, by the General Post Office or GPO. And it's um, from this time period that we start to see early communities of amateur radio folks um, uh, working, uh, starting to come together, although it does take a few years. Interestingly enough, there is no distinction um, between professional and amateur licenses. Um, and um, it's not really until 1911 that we can start having sort of more concrete information about the folks who are contributing to amateur radio work um, and indeed some experimental um, work, as you can see by the name of the license, it's an experimental form number one. Um, and so in 1911, two things happen at the same time. Firstly, um, the Manchester Wireless Society is formed, which is considered the first amateur radio club in the UK. And secondly, the journal on the left, the Marconiograph, um, published in 1911 and named, named Wireless World in 1913, is um, published in the UK and this becomes a centre point um, and indeed a sort of semi-unofficial uh, publication for the Radio Society of Great Britain um, in the UK and is a really great way of tracking uh, the work of radio amateurs um, in the UK for the duration of its publication. Um, in 1913 um, the Wireless Society of uh, London is established um, it's later renamed the Radio Society of Great Britain, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with in 1922. And the early members are the sort of who's who of science, um, engineering, um, and also they have some clock manufacturers, so that would be Frank Hope Jones, um, uh, as well as many other pioneers in wireless communications. So that's sort of where the amateur radio scene in the UK was situating itself just before the First World War. It's also around this time, um, and it's um, relatively little documented, that we think the first um, woman to hold a wireless license um, in the UK is granted her license. Um, so in the Directory of Experimental Wireless Stations, uh, published in 1914, it lists Mrs. C.E. Ingram, um, with call sign IXI, um, and she's at Ingram's Commercial Wireless School at Ilford in Essex. Um, unfortunately, I can't seem to find any images of her or indeed any further information related to the Commercial Wireless School, but definitely some further research required. Um, and her license was a commercial license and was chiefly used by the pupils at her, at her and probably, I would imagine, um, given the time period, um, her husband's uh, wireless telegraphy school. And it is worth noticing, um, as we heard um, in the earlier presentation on QRV, uh, a new BYL perspective on becoming ham citizen by Laura Brandt and El Elizabeth MacDonald, that there, there are continue to be barriers um, to women in, in amateur radio today. Um, and that was no less true um, 100 years ago, um, just immediately prior to the First World War. And um, it is worth noting that actually during the First World War um, was a particularly interesting time for women to have opportunities in technical professions and technically adjacent professions. So um, as I've done in research elsewhere, um, I've explored the fact that some of the first professional wireless operators, female professional wireless operators in the UK, um, so again, not radio amateur, um, were women, uh, sort of as an aside, were women working for the Women's uh, Royal Naval Service um, in 1917 and 1918 as uh, land-based or shore-based stationed um, wireless operators. Um, other activities taking place in the UK during the First World War um, was the worth, work of Gertrude Donis Thorpe. Um, now, this situates itself um, sort of it's quite close to citizen science. Um, and um, this is worked, this is based a little bit on the work, recent work of uh, Paul Carenza um, into the woman he claims is the world's first female DJ. So she was married to a chap called Captain Horace Donnersthorpe, who was a Marconi Company employee, uh, an early wireless amateur. Um, during the First World War, he trained um, wireless operators um, to use the newly developed radio valve sets. Um, 
and um, because they were quite experimental and sensitive and difficult to operate. Um, in his spare time, he conducted broadcasting radio experiments um, with his wife, um, even though she didn't, and as far as we can tell, never did have a wireless amateur license. Um, and indeed, um, all radio amateur licenses um, that didn't have a military purpose uh, were rescinded in 1914. Um, so she would do experimental uh, work with him to test the transmission range um, and eventually they set up a, uh, a broadcast program um, where they would uh, play records and do small range transmissions um, for the local military camps that were capable of receiving that and it, it is considered an early example of both uh, citizen science in terms of broadcast range of radios and, and how that actually worked uh, but also broadcast radio um, in the UK. Then in 1922, um, uh, the British licenses are returned. Captain Donisthorpe um, is the, the first individual to get his license back. Um, he gets his license uh, to AB. And in February 1922, there are um, nearly 7,000 uh, licensed radio amateurs in the UK capable of receiving radio, um, but only 268 um, with transmission licenses. And it's worth noting that post First World War, um, they now had access to radio valve um, equipment, ex-military, um, and were capable of starting to experiment with long distance transmissions using medium and short waves. So in 1921, um, there began a series of experiments. Um, and this is where we really start to settle into the citizen science and amateur radio. Um, so there's a series of US UK experiments, um, experimenting initially with shortwave, but um, at least in the UK, there were licensing issues around that. So um, in theory, amateur radio operators in the UK could only operate on the medium wave and above. Um, although this was little monitored because it was believed at the time that uh, shortwave transmissions uh, were sort of not particularly useful for military and uh, commercial communications. There was an idea that basically at the time that the longer um, the longer the wave, the longer the um, transmission potential, and it wasn't really until radio amateurs got involved in these experiments in 1921 and 1922 to prove both the technical operation, um, but also to examine how long distance um, shortwave radio actually worked, that they began to realize the true potential, uh, particularly in terms of long distance transmission of shortwave experiments. Um, so it was um, in 1921 that they began a series of experiments um, across the Atlantic um, using the 200 meter medium wave band um, to see would they be capable of transmitting uh, first one way and then uh, bi-directionally across the Atlantic. Um, now around this time, as I'm sure at least some of you know, the US radio amateurs were limited to 100 watts transmitters um, and in the UK it was uh, worse than that, they were limited to 10 watts. Um, so with the first experiments, the, um, the, US, uh, the US radio amateurs transmitted um, towards the U well not towards, um, uh, transmitted and the UK attempted to receive them but nonetheless um, they were unable to receive um, the transmissions. And it's worth bearing in mind that um, although Heaviside has uh, published his, the mathematics and theory around what he called, unsurprisingly, the Heaviside layer, um, but what is more commonly referred to as the Canelli Heaviside layer, um, that it's still, there's not necessarily a massive amount of practical evidence around this. And indeed, I will come back to this um, shortly. So the experiments continue. Um, later in 1921, the Wireless Society of London, soon to be renamed the RSGB, uh, put in place a special one kilowatt transmitter at the London Electrical Supply Company, um, in which was um, notably home to the first UK transmission license uh, granted after the First World War to AA. And in this case, messages were received in the US, um, but unfortunately, two-way contact was not made. Then in December 1921, um, there was further transatlantic experiments and tests conducted. And on the 8th of December, WF Byrne, 2KW, in Sale, um, in Cheshire, received the first US-UK transatlantic radio amateur signal um, and later um, received the first complete transatlantic US-UK message, which was sent by the Radio Club of America 1BCG, and signals were sent using the 230 metre band. 
then uh, a couple of years later, on the 8th of December 1923, the first two-way UK-US amateur radio contact was made between Jack Partridge, 2KF, in the UK, and Ken Warner, a one um, o oh, in the United States. So some very exciting um, uh, experiments in terms of the technical potential of shortwave radio um, and a sort of a, an exciting collaboration between groups of radio amateur in both the US um, and in the UK. Excuse me, Liz. Then, yep. Are, are your slides supposed to be updating? We're still um, seeing... No, actually, um, there was the, there's almost there's very few images um, oh. for the next couple of bits of the talk. Okay, um, people are just running. I'm sorry. Yeah, Thank you. sorry. I probably should have said that. Um, yes, for this section, um, unfortunately, there wasn't very many images um, for this next section of the talk. But you can look at, at Nelly Corey in the in, in the interim period if you're uh, so inclined. Should be coming up in just a few minutes. Thank you. Um, Thank you for checking that, though. Um, so in June, um, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about the solar eclipse um, experiments. Um, so in June 1927, um, RSGB members um, started carrying out tests on the shortwave bands um, in conjunction with the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research um, and the Institution of Electrical Engineers, uh, now the IET, uh, during the solar eclipse on the 2344, 46, 90 and 100 metre bands. And they were expected to produce uh, data on the height of the Canelli Heaviside layer, um, which the, the General Post Office was um, very interested in, in terms of their licensing, um, uh, in part because of their licensing of um, radio licenses in the UK, but also for other reasons. Um, and radio amateurs involved in this included um, Ralph Royal, G2WJ, uh, and Barbara Dunn, uh, G6YL, who, as you might have guessed by her name, was the first uh, female wireless amateur in the UK and others. Um, and some of their results were published in an Institute of Radio Engineers report. Um, so they're very much contributing to the scientific understand of the, uh, understanding of the ionosphere at the time. Um, so next we move on to Nellie Corrie, um, the G2YL and um, her experiments with um, the high frequency band. So she was the third um, female uh, radio, the third licensed uh, British radio amateur um, in the UK, licensed in 1934. So the first, um, as I mentioned, was Barbara Dunn, uh, G6YL in 1927, and the second was Anne Burns, G21A, uh, G2IA even in 1928. So um, shortly after getting her license um, between 1936 and 1940, um, she began authoring the monthly 28 megahertz reports um, or megacycles as they would refer to at the time, um, published in the RSGB um, TNR bulletins. And um, she also produced daily recordings of occurrences um, on the same frequency and basically building a dossier of information about the sun and its effects on the ionosphere. And so this led to her collaborating with over 24 different radio amateurs uh, from the RSGB, most prominently Dennis Heitman, G6DH, um, in which they observed the so-called hissing phenomenon. Um, and that in fact, it was not just confirmed to 28 megacycles. Um, and indeed, uh, a limited number of amateurs continued observations um, into the Second World War. And it is worth noting um, that most of the radio amateurs um, in the UK during the Second World War either ended up uh, joining the military as wireless operators, um, but a small but significant few um, ended up joining the radio security service as voluntary operator, uh, voluntary interceptors even, um, listening in on German uh, enemy transmissions. And indeed, one of them, indeed, at least one of them was a woman, um, Helena uh, Hope Crawley, G2DDY, who listened in um, with her husband. Um, and unfortunately, she recently passed away. So returning to Corrie, um, Corrie and Heitman um, corresponded with the British physicist Edward Appleton um, on their observations of the ionosphere and solar interference, and indeed with Wireless World, the periodical I mentioned earlier in the talk before the Second World War, about their observations. And then in 1945 and 1946, they passed on all of the data that they had gathered uh, between 1936 and 1939. And um, it's interesting to note 
that Appleton published quite a bit about this um, and he indeed acknowledged Heitman's early observations in some of his later writings on solar noise um, but as far as I know not of those of um, Corey um, which um, obviously um, is um, a shame um, and it's also worth um, noting that um, this is obviously an activity um, that continues um, through to the present day in terms of um, what amateur radio folks um, get up to in terms of solar observations. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, right. So um, next up, um, I want to look at um, satellites. Um, and um, what amateur radio uh, folks have been involved in terms of experimentation around. Um, sorry, I think I've skipped something. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I wanted to talk about 1957. So this was both the International Geographical uh, Geophysical Year, um, but also, as you might have guessed from the picture, um, and as I'm sure all of you know, um, the launch of Sputnik 1, um, the first um, artificial satellite to be launched into space. Um, so in 1957, radio amateurs in the UK um, became involved in various observational studies connected with the International Geographical Geophysical Year, um, as indeed did many professional scientists. So first, um, they looked at the aurora and related transmission conditions on the high frequency amateur bands uh, between the UK and Canada. Um, and then a study of auroral communications on the VHF amateur bands. Um, and finally, reception observation of solar noise um, on the VHF and UHF bands. So very much kind of continuing the work of Corey and Heitman and others that have been um, conducted in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, it was also in 1957 um, that Sputnik 1 was launched um, and its progress was tracked um, around the world, but um, in the UK, perhaps most importantly, by many RSGB uh, amateur radio members who were obviously significantly interested and um, in some cases, um, uh, discomforted by the launch uh, by Russia, um, or more precisely by the Soviet Union, um, of an artificial satellite ahead of their American allies. Um, but also, um, it was tracked by the um, newly uh, sort of newly create, uh, finished uh, Mark I uh, telescope, uh, radio telescope at Jodrell Bank Radio Observatory, um, where I was fortunate enough to work for a year um, and will always keep a uh, a warm spot in my heart. So a very exciting year for uh, the amateur radio community and citizen science um, generally, as well as specifically to the UK. Um, so the, the last example I wanted to talk about was um, Oscar and um, the amateur radio satellite community. Um, so um, it's worth noting that 1957, Sputnik 1 is launched. Um, less than two years later, um, a small group of um, amateur radio enthusiasts in San Francisco um, conceive of OSCAR, um, so the first of the orbiting satellites carrying amateur radio. Um, and they do um, eventually launch this in December 1961. Um, and this is only uh, four years after the launch of Sputnik 1. Um, so quite an incredible achievement, both in terms of American aerospace, um, but also amateur radio enthusiasm um, for new platforms for both uh, the technical practice of amateur radio, but also the scientific uh, principles that underpin these as well. Um, and so they managed um, to build this, um, which was, was launched um, uh, for a mere $63. Um, so um, very sort of uh, reasonable and efficient, and I would expect nothing less of the amateur radio community um, in the US as well as in the UK. So transmissions were received, um, all around the world, of course, um, as they were intended, um, including by members um, in the UK. Um, and so I do realise that's um, not quite up to the present day, but um, I suppose I wanted to talk a little bit um, about um, the more general sort of themes around what we've discussed. So um, I think, you know, when we think about citizen science, um, we think about activities that blur the boundaries between amateur and professional. Um, and it is my opinion um, that amateur radio, despite the name, is something that also um, situates itself within that sort of 
um, space between amateur and professional. Um, I know from having looked through uh, the programme for the event here tonight um, that absolutely um, quite a lot of the activities of people on the programme um, today and tomorrow um, whose work definitely um, would situate itself um, between sort of amateur um, and professional. Um, but I also think that some of the best of what the amateur radio community has achieved in terms of citizen science, but also more generally, um, has achieved when, has been achieved when a diverse range of voices have been brought to the table. Um, and indeed, I think that is representative of what the amateur radio communities nationally and internationally are trying to achieve. Um, and I would argue that um, some of the research in citizen science um, uh, by Barbara Dunn and others um, has uh, that the contribution of women um, has been an important um, aspect of the work that's been done. Um, and from the talk that I heard earlier, um, it's, it's great to see that people are considering how how women and and indeed um, other voices that might not stereotypically have been included in the amateur radio community um, are are thinking about how our spaces um, can be uh, made indeed um, more welcome for the different kinds of um, people who can contribute um, to the community and to the work that 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 has been done. And I suppose then the sort of my final point is well how how does this connect more generally? to um, sort of like inspiring interest in amateur radio, in citizen science and in STEM. And I would argue that, you know, um, if you, you can't or not, you can't. Um, I mean, the, the phrase is you can't be it if you can't see it. Um, I think it, it makes it incredibly challenging um, that, you know, when we look at role models, the, the stereotype in science, technology, engineering and maths is of the sort of the genius um, usually white scientist, um, usually uh, male. Um, and actually that doesn't represent the creativity, the collaboration um, and the excitement that is science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, you know, not all of us can be geniuses um, and I'm not claiming that I am myself. Very few of us are, but actually many of us, if not all of us have a role to play in science in amateur radio, in citizen science, um, and in science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics. We all, I think, at least should be able to feel like we could, if we so wanted to, um, take part um, in the scientific community in some ways as amateur professionals or just passionate enthusiasts. Um, it's something that um, a model of science capital um, that we uh, follow closely at the Science Museum in London, um, and I think it's an interesting, um, and I would say, I would hope welcome aspect um, to the work of both citizen science, amateur radio um, and HAMSI. Um, so that's probably the quickest um, history of radio um, you may have heard, but I really wanted to give the highlights um, and, and just to hear what you guys have to say. So uh, just for acknowledgements, um, obviously, uh, I need to thank for the images for the Radio Society of Great Britain, particularly Elaine Richards, um, G4 LFM, and I'd highly recommend her book um, if you haven't had a chance to read it. Um, the Science Museum and the History of Science Museum in Oxford. Uh, Bill was very generous uh, with his support um, for giving this talk. And last time not least, I have to thank my wife for her endless cups of tea as I was working on this presentation. Um, over the last while. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I can see there's sort of um, some that I think there's things coming in the chat um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I've also included uh, my email address um, and my Twitter handle as well if people want to get in touch through other mediums. But again, thank you very, very much uh, for having me here this evening. And um, I will stop sharing and start looking at some of the questions. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. Liz, Dr. Bruton. It was a wonderful talk and I really appreciate you bringing up the history and really um, continuing this conversation we're having about uh, inclusion and diversity and history and citizen science and all of these things. So um, why don't I turn it over to both Bill and uh, to Liz McDonald, who are our moderators, and they will help uh, moderate some of the questions. So.